Letters to Lenin, Episode 1, written by Olivia Lewis Brown. Hello? Voice! I'm Shug! Speaks! Anyone alive out there? Speaks? Is that you? Anyone else with you? Where's Armstrong? Here! I'm here! Welcome. Yeah, mate. I, I can see you. Can you walk? I, I think so. What the hell happened? A cave-in down Samson's End. You, you reckon he's still alive? Can't be sure. Someone's going to have to go down there and get him. But what if he ate a gas bucket? We'd be dead before we pulled him out. We can't just leave him, Sphinx. It's not safe anymore. We have to go now. Wait a second. Did you hear that? Oh, 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 oh. Is that... Petrenko! Nikolai, can you hear me? Ben, what about Sphinx? I'll be, I'll be fine. Get Petrenko out. But you can't walk. No, I'll go get him. Take Sphinx up top and tell Petrenko's still alive down here. Go, now! Bernard. Don't argue with me. Go! Petrenko! I'm coming, Petrenko! Come on, son. Put your arm around me. That's a good lad. Leonard! Wait! Petrenko, we need to move now. You could have hit a gas leak. We have to get him out. I couldn't pull him out. Pull him out. Jesus, Mary and Joseph. Is that already Samson under there? We hit the crux in the wall, and the whole scaffold thing came down on us. I tried to dig him out, but more dirt slid down. I had to keep him starting over and over. Calm down, boy. Put your arm over my shoulder. What about Horace? We need to focus on getting you out now. No. No, we can't leave him. Trinko, look at him. He's been dead since trouble hit him. I won't abandon him here! Listen to me. I'm not moving as long as you're down here. You try to get me killed, boy? No. Are you? No. Are you try to get me killed? No, sir! Then I need you to perform. Come on, on your feet. You won't let me die. I know you won't. That's it, boy. Come on, lean on me. Let's go. Was that the first time we've seen a man die up close? Yes. There was nothing you could have done, lad. These things are an act of God. An act of God? You must be having a laugh, Bernie. You want to know what killed poor old Horace? Pit owners who pay us pittance a week to work in conditions that kill us before we can figure out what we're doing is a bad idea. And why do we work these bootlicker jobs? Because we're in debt to the same bastards who pay us. Damn right we are. We're in debt to the same bastard who pays us. And debt makes you a slave. You're not wrong there, Boise. My wife drags me to church every Sunday and I swear even the big man himself doesn't have as much power over my life as Clemens Reed. Who's Clemens Reed? The man who pays your way in the world, boy. He's the great co-dictator of Manchester's East End. He pays us our salary, but he doesn't know nothing about the business of hauling coal. He inherited the pit deeds from his father, Ignatius Reed. As much of a tyrant as his old man before him, I say. A leech of a man he is. Clements Reed is part of the 1% of people who own every northern trade today. Coal, cotton, lumber, machinery. And most importantly, us. The common labourer. If you own the skill, you own the trade. So if you want to blame anyone for old Horace's death, blame the deep-pocketed sons of bitches who would rather we die from a cave-in than pay to make it safe. All right, boys, happy hour starts now. Get it while it's hot. All right, Griggsy, mate. Get all around on me. No problem, Bernie, mate. No problem at all. Take a lucky dip, boys. Get your money's worth. Um, 
Not for me, thank you. Oh, go on, lad. Have a swig of that. Put hers in your chest. There you go, good man. Just try not to get it on your clothes and don't smoke while you drink it. <laughs> Tastes like the devil's piss, that does. <laughs> oh, blend is it again, Gregor. You mind your own. With the tax they're putting on beer nowadays, I can't afford the fancy stuff. My brew sells itself on the promise you'll get top-heavy twice as fast for half the price. Oh, I can feel the green in my teeth. What the hell's in it? About half a pound of nunya. Nunya? Yeah, nunya business. All you need to know is it does its job. And your missus is keen on this little sideline profit. As long as it pays the bills and I stay out the doghouse, she's as happy as a rat with a gold tooth. Oi, Bernie, who's Johnny Newcomer here? Nikolai Petrenko. Nice to meet you. Likewise, Gregor Griggs, pub landlord. I must say, Petrenko's a bit of an exotic name for around here. Originally, I'm from Russia, St. Petersburg. Ah, you're one of the ones who came off the docks a few weeks ago, aren't you? I heard about the police there gathering you all up, shipping you off to God knows where, working for God knows who in some mumbo-jumbo land. So, you're one of the few who slipped the net, eh? Don't look so worried, boy. Round here, we don't talk to coppers. We take care of our own. Right, Bernie? Uh, we're more than equals now, son. Today, you're one of us. Sorry, Samson pegged it this morning. Caved in. Could have happened to anyone. Nikolai was with him at the end. Oh, poor old sod. God rest his soul. I'm assuming you're going to tell Nonny Samson, then? Nonny Samson? Horace Samson's missus. She works with her daughters down the cotton mills. I'm on my way to her now, Griggs. Just needed a bit of Dutch courage first. Eh? Old Bird will be waiting for him to come home. Better be off. Wait, Bernard, I should come. You sure, boy? It's not an easy thing telling a man's widow he's never coming home. She should hear it from someone who was with him at the end. You off then, Bernie? What about drinks? Well, if drinks are on me, then I'm going to make a toast. <clears throat> To Horace Sampson! Only time we boys can rest is when we're dead. Sleep well, mate. We'll miss you. To Horace! <coughs> Mum, come sit down. Let me do that. <coughs> no, no, Nancy, love. Don't trouble yourself. It's only a tickle. Don't let me worry about you, Mum. I mean it. You sit and sip that tea until you feel better. <laughs> really now, I'm a grown woman in her own home. I should be able to cook a bit of pottage by my own means. <coughs> I'm going to get the doctor to have another look at her tomorrow. You know she hates doctors poking and prodding at her. That's what Dad thinks when he gets home. See if we can afford the visit. Meryl, will you get that, love? Ma'am, Uncle Bernie's here. Bernardy! Well, isn't this a lovely surprise? Oh, you know, love. You feeling all right? You look a bit peaky. <laughs> I'm alive, aren't I? That's as all right as I'm ever going to be. Uncle Bernie! <laughs> <laughs> Auntie, sweetheart. Oh, look how much you've grown. Who's your friend, Uncle Bernie? Nice to meet you, I'm Nancy. Is he deaf or mute or both? This is Nikolai Petrenko. He's new to the crew, just got here from Russia. Ah, see, there's a language barrier. Cup of tea? Tea? Yes, for the both of us, thank you, love. What's wrong with you, boy? You look like you've been struck by lightning. I'm sorry, I, I couldn't think of what to say. Do you think she noticed? I reckon she thinks you're as sharp as a brick and just as thick. I've never seen a woman like her before. Her beauty, it, it startled me. Hey, you mind your manners, son. Salford women wear smiles at loaded guns. Ah, Nancy knows to keep her hand and her happiness. I don't be trying any funny business. Nancy, love, that stuff tastes like dishwater. Get the good tea bags out. Damn, Nonny, don't be wasting your good stuff on us. In this house, we'll treat you as well as you deserve. It's a dangerous life down them pits. Least we can offer is a decent cup of tea. Thank you, love. I reckon we'll be needing it. I'm surprised my Horace isn't strung between the both of you. I swear to God, Horace does nothing but hug that bleeding bar day and night. 
bloody waste of space. I have a good mind to box his ears a few rounds when he gets home. He just you wait. No, Nonny love, that's not it. Not this time. So come on then. Fess up, where is he? Out with the lads. Peel has got him again. Just tell me which station I need to go to get him. And from where Not I... love. Do you think we could have a word in private? Dad's tea is going cold, ma'am. Should I leave it on the stove? Hold on a minute, Nancy, dear. Whatever you need to say, you can say it in front of my girls. I don't know if I should be the one to do that, love. Bernie? You're making me fret now. What's the matter with you? None. <laughs> Mrs I... Simpson, your husband is dead. What did you say, boy? Uh, he died in a cave-in today. I was with him at the end. A prop collapsed and brought the vogue ceiling down on us. He kicked me out of the way before the rubble hit me. He died a hero. He's really gone? I'm so sorry. <coughs> Easy, old girl. You're not well enough for this. I'm fine. I'm not made of glass, you know. Well, I'll get you a fresh cup of tea. Stay right here. He's worked the seams 30 years. I don't understand. Are you sure it couldn't have been anyone else? It's dark down the pits, Mr Patrenko. You couldn't have seen him. It, it, it was him. I went down after Horace myself, ma'am. The shaft can only hold two people at a time. Could he have still been alive under the rubble? He was gone, sweetheart. Doris was dead from the minute rubble hit him. Even the Quinine Jimmy on site said it was as quick as a parting gift from this world as any of us muck men could hope for. Nonny. These things are no one's fault. He had a dodgy prop. Cheap materials. The new Mr. Reed supplies. He couldn't have known. But he could have! Nonny, there's no use blaming boys. Why wasn't he watching him? Why wasn't he helping him with the props? He's an old man! Mrs. Simpson, I'm sorry, but... So he won't bring my husband home, will it? You're there to watch him. You're there so he doesn't make mistakes. Now, Nonny, I know you're upset, but you're being a bit unfair on lad. It was an honest-to-God tragic accident. Do you know what else is a fair, Bernard? I'm without an husband and my children without a father because of an honest-to-God tragic accident. It wasn't his fault. Then who do I have to blame? Mr Reed, the company, the wooden prop. We're barely scraping by as it is. Nonny, myself and the boys will support you for as long as we can until Horace's compensation comes in. Or he's supposed to be closest friend. And we would have wanted us to stick by one another. I want him out of my house, Bernard! No! Nonny! Please, Mrs Simpson. Get out! Get out of my house now! Get out! <sighs> Come on, lad. Mrs Simpson, your husband saved my life. If he hadn't kicked me out of the way back then, uh, uh, I'm going to repay him. I swear it. Come, boy. I should go now. I think that's been enough said for today. I don't want you, pity boy! (laughs) You hear me? (laughs) Don't you ever darken this doorway again! (laughs) My dearest Vladimir... I hear the voice of the motherland call to me across the great blue expanse. Through papers and stale words, news of our country reaches me. Such a sudden parting from all that I know continues to make me regret my leaving you and your brother with the jaws of the law snapping at your heels. This country is dark and cruel to me. The people here are born with violence boiling in their blood. A hatred I recognize in the people of our mother Russia. For those who enforce themselves kings. Capitalists here are judge, jury and executioner. Such likeness I cannot help but see reflected of the Tsar and his entourage who dare to impugn the word of the people who keep him fat in his splendor. We, the people in Salford and in St. Petersburg, are both without voice. It is the only comfort of home I know here. I understand you cannot write me back for fear of the policia monitoring your messages. I do not expect your immediate reply. However, for my own sanity's sake, I must write in hopes of reaching your brother, who I abandoned in such tyranny. It was not my intention to bring a word to your door. 
I understand, Vladimir, you are an educated man and do not believe in violence, but sometimes it is needed. No great empire was founded on the grounds of pacifism and no gentle hand was ever extended to an enemy. I feel today I have glimpsed the first casualty of a rebellion. I watched a good man buried, murdered by his own tools, and yet his safety is so easily overlooked by his employers. Here, it is a deep and festering poverty I have never glimpsed before. People starve for the lack of change. Yet what baffles me most, my brother, is despite the hardship, love prevails. Brotherhood keeps men alive in a hell all men share. Here I have never felt such belonging. Regardless of my foreign title, they treat me as an equal. I swear upon the memory of my workmate, I will see this corporate torture of my newfound kinsmen no more. A union, a united voice must be founded to protect the innocent from the corrupt. I now understand the reason I have been sent to this wasteland. This is my test. To realize how to save our people by saving another. Knowledge will become the bullet in my gun, loaded for my return home. My dearest Volodya, I beg of you to keep this letter well hidden until the eyes of Alexander meet my words. But know this, no matter where in the world I take shelter, my heart still beats with the drum of rebellion pounding in the streets of Petersburg. In Salford, I will learn patience. In Salford, I will survive until you reply. Until we meet again, my brother, your loyal patriot. Nikolai. Who is it? It's Nancy. Nancy Sampson. I'm Oris Sampson's daughter. If it's a bad time, I can come back later. Uh, no, no, please, please come in. I apologize for my hesitance in opening the door. There are many here who would rub me blind. I hope I'm not intruding. No, no, not at all. Uh, would you like... Uh... If I may be quite to the point, Mr Petrenko, I've come to apologise for my mother's behaviour. I hope you can understand. In Salford, my mother was raised to be as sharp as a battle axe when wounded. I can assure you she didn't mean a word of it. Oh, Miss Sampson, I was merely fulfilling my duty. As am I. If you'll let me, I'd like to repay the courtesy by cooking you dinner. Do you like eggs? I'm afraid it's all we had left in the cupboard. Oh, Miss Sampson, there's really no need for in you In our to... culture, Mr Petrenko, food is very important. To refuse my offer would be an insult to my hospitality. Oh, I wouldn't want to insult anyone. Good. Then I'll get the stove on, shall I? Oh, careful there! Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see them. It's my fault. After I'm done with them, I tend to leave them strewn about. Uh, do you like to read? I wish I could. I left school to work the mills with my mother, so I never learned. It's a strange feeling. Seeing words that mean so much to other people and realising your own language is foreign to you. I could teach you to read it, if you want. You'd do that? If you'd like. I have no money to pay for tuition. Oh, I would not dare charge you. Information should be free to all. You're a strange man. So willing to help someone like me without anything to gain by it. It makes me anxious as to why. What is someone like you doing working down the pit? Same as your father, trying to survive. Well, I'll be a good student, I promise. <laughs> then I guess we'll be seeing a little more of each other. I guess we will. Do you smell burning? Oh, the eggs! Thank you. Think nothing of it. The eggs are very resilient. I could burn water if I tried hard enough. You didn't really answer me question before, Mr Petrenko. What's an educated man like you doing on a godforsaken spit of land like this? Hope you haven't come for the weather. If I tell you the truth, can I trust you to keep it a secret? Of course. Promise me. I can swear upon a Bible if that helps. <laughs> <laughs> well, Miss Simpson, I'm in hiding. How exciting. Hiding from who, exactly? 
for Russian police. My brothers and I, we did something that could have changed the political future of Russia forever. It went wrong. I am here, awaiting a message, hoping I can return to St. Petersburg to begin a revolution against the Tsar and his loyalists. You really would have started a revolution? Not by myself. Alexander Olyanov, he was our leader. He put me on a ship and sent me here. I would have been hanged at dawn if it wasn't for him. I don't think I quite understand. At the moment, nor do I. I write to him, but his post is monitored. I can't receive anything back while police are still looking for myself and Alexander. I send the letters instead to his younger brother, Vladimir. His parents are registered monarchists, and his mother is a trusted ex-member of the Imperial Court. He's a safe source, for now. Vladimir will let me know when I can return home. How many letters have you composed so far? The letter on the table will be my first. This? There's nothing on this table but a bit of milk and bread. Ah, just because you can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. I think the cheese has slid a bit too far off your cracker. It's written in invisible ink. Do you really expect me to believe that? Oh, I see. This is a way to put me in my place. Well, just because you're smarter than me doesn't mean you can make me feel stupid for your own amusement. What? Nancy, where are you going? Mr Petrenko, I came here as a polite gesture of goodwill and now you insult my intelligence with this... this bunkum. (laughs) Bunkum? (laughs) Yes, it's absolute claptrap and I won't be made a fool of. What if I prove it to you? You're having me on. I'm not. I'll show you. Come over here. Come on. Now, I take a lump of bread and make an ink pot. Then you take your milk and pour it into the pot of bread. This gives the ink a pumice while absorbing any excess. Uh, You take your quill, dip, and write your concealed message. Nothing's there. Well, you don't know the trick to it yet. Hand me those messages from the stove. Now, look again. What do you see? I don't believe it. I can see the letters with a firelight behind it. (laughs) The flame shows up the silhouette of the writing. And as if by magic, your message appears unread by those who don't know how to see it. This is how they would send secret messages to members of court in the Middle Ages. So you write all your letters in milk? It is the only way I can be sure the police won't read it. Only Vladimir and Alexander will know the secret of how to access my words. They'll recognise it from our childhood. And they're your brothers? We do not share the same parents, but they're as close to me as if they were my blood. How did you come to know them, then? It's a story for another time. Well, from the sounds of it, you might not get another opportunity. If you can't be interrogated by me, you have no chance back there. Well, ours was a happenstance meeting. My father was a factory worker. We were walking home one morning when my father and I spied two boys I knew from school. They were going to the lake to fish. At a moment's glance, I saw one of the boys slip and disappear down the side of the cliff face. The ground, unstable and wet from the rain, had collapsed below him, sending the small boy splashing down into troubled waters. I alerted my father and we ran to the lakeside. My father dove in and saved the boy from drowning. That boy and his brother turned out to be Alexander and Vladimir Ulyanov. From that day on, our families were thick as thieves. But why is your monarchy so terrible that you'd want to start a revolution with them? You couldn't possibly understand until you've seen it for yourself. In my country, such a high tax and low wages means we can barely afford to feed ourselves. Instead, we look to the Tsar and the Romanovs who cavort in grand palaces, commission illustrious presents and drink themselves into a stupor like gilded pigs in a golden pen. It's a terrible truth. Like me nana used to say, we at the bottom of the food chain are all just little fishes in a big pond. But what if the pond only seems big? Because we have never seen the ocean. Mr Petrenko, some are born smart and some are born lucky. We must be grateful for what we have, no matter how small. My father lived and died by that principle. Clemens Reed and the Romanovs may have been born lucky, but they lack respect for the beauty of humanity. And now I've met you, I've seen how beautiful the world can be. I should be going. 
I don't want my mother and sister wondering where I am. Really? So soon? Well, I hope now you're full and warm that this morning's rudeness is forgotten. It never crossed my mind. Good night, Mr Petrenko. Good night, Miss Simpson. Dearest Alexander, over the past few months I have found stability alongside men, bred of hardships we both share. There are only four I trust in the entire Black Plain of England. Bernard, Malcolm, Hugo, and Oliver. Oi, lad, will you get back in line? Bernard Bradshaw, the crew leader, runs the East Pits, the big seams. He's a soft touch with a pickaxe, but could knock you through to next week if you try his saintly patience. In fact, in his youth, he was once a promising boxer. <laughs> He'd never admit it sober, but Bernard learned to fight from the person he could only call his old man. Even the mention of his father's name is more painful than a punch. The bastard used to knock Bernard and his mother unconscious in a drunken outrage until the time Bernard learned to hit him back. Before the pits, you could catch him fighting gypsies in underground tournaments. His nickname, Bradshaw the Salford Sandman. Bernard had a rare skill in boxing they call the sleeper's touch. On the rare occasion he got angry enough, he could knock out a man with a single punch. Bernard was on his way to winning the national championships, but as he quotes, Sure, I could have gone pro, but truth is I bloody hate violence. The only reason I was half decent was because every match I was fighting my old man. Well, in my head, I mean. I promised my mum I won't kill him. My old man deserved less than a quick ticket out anyway. But knowing he was still thieving my oxygen left with enough rage that if used properly could tie me over into going pro. Why not? For the punters, it was entertainment. For me, it was therapy. I'd knock him every shade of black and blue. Fist-shaped bruises in every hue had decorated me at one time or another, and I'd label them by colour. That's how you know what's broken, mind, when your fingers turn into black puddings. Got to know how you're built to go pro. But at the time, I had this idea, you see. Don't get many of them, so I had to pay attention. I thought that maybe if I scraped enough money together from doing something I hated, I could put it towards something I loved, and that was fishing. Oh, yes. You're looking back at the Manchester Bear Bay angling champion off Sir Henry Wood Promenade. Ah, with these sort of smackers, I could start again somewhere. Live a quiet life with a nice fat wife. I got close, too, until only one man stood between me and my fat life and wife. And let me tell you, he was no dolly mixture. But I had to learn the hard way. Ideas are like hemorrhoids. Every arsehole gets one eventually. It was a book, sir by the name of Pee Wee Murphy, otherwise known as the Atomic Bull, who pushed Bernard to the brink. Murphy inspired a hate so deep that the first punch Bernard threw would be his last. Come on, you bastard! One round, you and me, you hitting the floor! Pee Wee Murphy died first round from a broken neck. The punch struck was said to have been so hard and so clean it had shattered Murphy's vertebrae from ear to shoulder blade, a move better known in boxing as the handman's fracture. Unable to cope knowing his anger had got the better of him, Bernard ended his career and went into hiding, choosing to work in the pits. Thirty years later, and the story of the Salford Sandman still hasn't died, but the fire in Bernard did. Oliver Spinks works the small seams. He's the youngest, but the toughest guy we know. Nothing, and I mean nothing, could kill the bastard. He'd lost a leg in a cave-in. And even been diagnosed with partial deafness from a water break two years ago. And yet he keeps on working. He'd worked down the pit from the time he could grasp a pick in his tiny, pre-adolescent hand. There are two things Spinks loved in his life. His mother, Irene, who manages the local shop, and most importantly, his canaries. He's kind and gentle beyond his years. He'd keep mice in his pockets to stop them freezing in the cold shafts in winter. No matter what life throws at him, Spinks always digs with a smile on his face and a tune in his voice like birdsong. The crew nickname him Jolly Ollie, as it takes more courage than most men possess to smile on the face of adversity, as Oliver Spinks did. 
Now Hugo Boyce is as honest as they come. In fact, his sharp tongue makes people uneasy. Oi, what you gawking at? I swear to God, mate, I'll ram my foot so far up your ass the dentist will be picking my toenails between your teeth. He loves to visit the housewives of the men he works alongside. He's empty of sentiment. Least for the trouble he follows like a dog on a leash, or as he puts it. What? I only have enough blood to power one head, or the other. <laughs> Liquor and poker made him a poor man. However, the ultimate prize he had his eyes on for years now was Horace Simpson's eldest daughter, Nancy Simpson. Oi, darling, why don't you come and sit in Boise's lap? Get bent! <laughs> uh, I would drink her bath water. Even a schwill's too good for you, mate. <laughs> Hugo had loved her since they'd been kids and asked Horace on several occasions if he could marry her. When Nancy had rejected his proposals, Hugo held out hope that one day she might just settle for him. Hey! Oh, here he is! Oh, how'd it go this time, Romeo? I've said it once and I'll stand by it again. In times of a crisis, women usually panic and run into the arms of the nearest man, no matter how stupid or ugly. Boys, my job is to be that man. She'll come around, you'll see. When the time is right, she'll need a man like me. Please. The only way you'll get into her knickers is if you pinch them off the washing line. <laughs> Here, no man is more respected than Malcolm Armstrong. In his youth, he'd been a war hero, mutilated in the heat of battle. He wears every jagged scar like a badge of honor and can be regularly found surrounded by those desperate to know the stories behind each mark. So how'd you get this one, big boy? Paper cut? The Boer War, darling. Transvaal Rebellion, 1881. I was a Tommy, scouting the long grass for boars around the prison site. Suddenly, a boar coated in mud and sand jumped out at me, bayonet in hand, ready to slice me from ear to ear. I dodged the bastard and pinned him down. He slashed at the arms, trying to get away like a bear in a trap, but I held firm, smashing his hand until he was forced to drop the knife. That's when I shot him, right between the eyes. Bastard barely had time to blink. And so these are the people I have chosen to align myself with, and here I will stay amongst them, awaiting your communication. I worry for your longevity, brother. I fear for my own. However, Manchester is offered for a time a brief and amiable solace, a sanctuary of modern capitalism. In Britain, I endure, brother, for you know all I do is for you. Send my love to your mother, Maria, until we meet again. Your patriot, Nikolai. End of episode one. Starring Stephen Hannafy as Nikolai Petrenko, Ryan Butterworth as Bernard Bradshaw, Dale Grant as Malcolm Armstrong and Gregor Griggs, Abigail Pigeon as Nancy Sampson, Mandy Hester as Muriel Sampson, Alex Ross as Hugo Boyce, and Callum Taylor as Oliver Spinks.